I'm Steve Smith. This is Malar Patel. Malar is one of our students. Great student, great guy. My mother would have loved his disposition. What we're going to do is go through 100 points. And the points are from courtside chatter, coaching. What forms a culture? Well, we've said rules form a culture, but also the language. It goes both ways. We can start a sentence or our students can start a sentence. We can finish it for them. What Mallard will do is read a line from his notes, and then I'll add a few comments. Go ahead. Don't be a house cat. Number one, don't be a house cat. Not too long ago, a parent said that. My kid is such a house cat. And I said, what do you mean by that? And he said, my kid is not going to do too well hunting, being in the street. I think people should go out and watch a, a cat that's not a house cat. You let your cat outside the house, they can hunt. They can hunt. But with that, we want to make sure that we let people know that we have a rule within our program. You have to be over 60 and bald to use nicknames. Nicknames can be hurtful, so we don't use nicknames. We don't let nicknames stick. But I think of Golden Retriever. I don't want to mention any names to be politically correct. Don't want to mention any names. Spencer Johnson, Golden Retriever. It just He's such a great kid. He's a Golden Retriever. Everybody loves a golden retriever. We say that with the idea, yeah, we want kids to be loved. Coaches are going to love kids with a great work ethic, a great attitude. But we want to have players think, I want to be respected. I want to be respected. So maybe a German shepherd. They got that look. What's, the, what's number two? What if you're not on top of the food chain? Yes, I tell kids that all the time. If you're not on top of the food chain, we actually have kids run. The other day we put approximately 10 players on an outdoor field that's 400 yards and we have several students that get right under five minutes. I think your best is 502, right? 502 on a dirt field, that's very good. And so we have a player who's just in the 450s and I said, whoever gets lapped, that's how it works. That's how it works when you're not on top of the food chain. What's next? Hungry dog hunts best. Yeah, when we ask for mind vitamins, and mind vitamins make you stronger. You know, we always say anything that doesn't kill you makes you stronger. That's the first one we hear. We say, all right, kids, give us a mind vitamin. Everybody needs to be motivated. Motivated need, means to move. So, yeah, hungry dog hunts best. What's, Nadal looks like he's playing for his lunch money. Nadal looks like he's playing for his lunch money. Jimmy Connors, that's the first time I heard that. It looks like he's broke. It looks like he has no money in his pocket. Now, coming from Jimmy, if people are well-read, years ago, it used to happen all the time, his kids all played with a, a wooden Jack Kramer in this country, and they would play for rackets. They would play for money, you know, put something on the line, even if you're out there playing for a Mountain Dew. Mountain Dews might not be healthy, but it's healthy to play for something. So, yeah, Nadal looks like he's playing for lunch money. What's the next number? Number five. Number five. It's okay to be dumb, but don't be dumb and lazy. That comes from Mark Costello's father, the late Vince Costello. He used to say that. It's okay to be dumb and, and not sorry, Mallard, but teenagers are dumb. I used to be one of them. I'm still dumb, but not as dumb as I was. But yeah, Vince Costello. It's okay to be dumb, guys, but don't be dumb and lazy. What else you got? You can tell a competitor by looking in their eyes. The eye, eye of the tiger. If a kid looks right at you and they're nodding, they're coachable. If you say something to a kid and they look down, they look away, that means the coaching bounces right off of them. It does have to look like they're in a damn fight. They're focused. You can tell by their eyes. Another one. Choices are just an illusion. If you want to be good, you have no choices. Nick Saban, Alabama. We use that all the time. So I can just start that and say, okay, give me the Nick Saban quote, our number one Nick Saban quote. Choices are just an illusion. If you want to be good, you have no choices. Really, um, to be good at tennis is a choice first. Go ahead. Success is a series of making the right choices. John Wooden, success. Series of making the right choices. Get up in the morning, do the push-ups, do the sit-ups, have the practice chart. Are you checking off all the boxes? Are you doing this and you doing that? Give me another one. Your work ethic should be your easiest choice. Martin St. Louis, hockey player, St. Louis, uh, he play, he's from Montreal, he played, I think, a little bit for St. Louis, Calgary, but he really made his mark with the Tampa Bay Light, end of his career, he was with the Rangers. 
Rudy, five foot nothing, 100, 100, 100 nothing. I, I did, um, I did hear one of his teammates say he's the same size all three ways. This way, this way, this way. Just, but that's, that's from Martin St. Louis. Um, it's easy to be the hardest worker. And I mean, that guy, he was not really given a chance. And next thing you know, he's the MVP, Stanley Cup champion, Martin St. Louis. What do you got? Work is the dirtiest word in the English dictionary. People are afraid of work. Tennis kids, and I know tennis is year round today, kids. Um, the tennis kids are just they're not working part time jobs, but wash, have them wash, or watch them wash dishes, watch them pick up weeds. Uh, they got to get their hands dirty. Uh, people are really a lot of times afraid of work. They just got to get after it. Too many people are afraid of work. They're afraid of getting their hands dirty. Ah, we've already said that, so we'll skip that one. It will only work if you work. Yeah, uh, Dave Anderson's wife, Jenna. I like to make it a story. Where did you hear something? And that's a great way to remember it. Say, yeah, I heard this from so-and-so, and this is where I was, and I've let that in my treasure chest. It will only work if you work. Go ahead. The only place success comes before work is in the dictionary. Yeah, so we did this exercise last week with Don Meyer. You could have juniors just listen to this in a car ride. And yes, you got to go to work. You won't be successful before you work. Give us the number. What number are you on? 14. 14. What do you got? Success has three letter S's. Yes, that's an original. Let me ask you, what are they? Uh, struggle, sacrifice, and suffer. Say that again. Struggle, sacrifice, and suffer. Very good. Next. The Spanish Federation, and then success breeds success. Yeah, I'll go back to the Spanish Federation and you know it's, uh, that's part of their training. Kids need to learn to suffer. They need to learn to suffer. I mean, the coach gets to stop, watch out. You're running 400s. You run a 400, you get a minute. I mean, it's a lot easier to just be a couch potato, just be on the phone like this. Give us a number. What do you got? 16. John Wooden's Pyramid. John Wooden's Pyramid. Pyramid of success. Um, I think it's a great exercise to take the words and you know, have, we have kids where they have that in their notes. The TV show that I'm really enjoying watching is Ted Lasso. And there's a scene where one of the coaches is just looking at John Woods' pyramid of success. I've been lucky enough to be on the UCLA campus where he won 10 national championships. Um, you give me a word from the pyramid of success and I'll guess one. Condition. Poise. Team spirit. Industriness. Friendship. Um, condition. Loyalty. Skill. Powerful words. The John Wooden. People need to study that. A kid needs to have that. You know. Okay. Get get out your bag. You got your notebook, and should be able to rattle off key words from uh, Wooden's Pyramid of Success. Next. Don't be high maintenance. Oh. With uh, low maintenance. Don't draw attention to yourself. Don't demand attention. Yeah, just get it done. Actually, we do this in practice. Say someone uh, has a sprained ankle, most of the time we'll have them sit on a Gatorade water jug and work on their serve. We'll have them chart matches. But we also can say, okay, take the next 30 minutes and I want you to just tally one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. And the person whose name's called out the most, generally, is the most uncoachable. Now, there's always a side that they need the most help, and we understand that. But if you're high maintenance, your name is called off all the time. Don't be a mama's boy. Don't be a mama's boy. We don't want to just pick on the moms, the dads too. But sometimes it's the mom who wants their son to re remain a little boy, and the dad wants the son to become a man. Um, it's just, it's just natural. Mommy's baby, they're babies. But yeah. Um, and then also we get to the point where we start talking to teenagers like Malhar and, you know, the mom's the mom and they, they want to make the cheesecake and they want to have their kid be happy and they want to do this and that for them, pamper them. I coached a girl whose father played in the NFL and he said that the mom used to take one piece of red carpet and set it down, another piece of red carpet and set it down. 
But yeah, you don't want to be a mama's boy. Next. Don't have the macho male ego. Yeah, I yell that out to guys on the court, macho male ego, just trying to blast the ball. But I think also, too, is um, you talk to adults, the, the older they get, the better they were. Um, so it's like when we make videos, slow motion videos, they can be pretty incriminating. Somebody's been coaching someone for five years and then we make a slow motion video. It's a fact that over the years, female coaches have been much more open to our input than male coaches. Give us a number. What number are you on? 20. Ego kills. Yeah, that's something you hear all the time. It's good to have a healthy ego, but for the most part, check your ego at the door. Tennis court, Vic Braden's Mistake Center. You're going to make mistakes. Learn from your mistakes. People will make a mistake. Say they, say they make a technical mistake. And then the response to that, the physical action response, is emotional. And that's a negative. It's a negative. They're not, they don't react to it with high negative and instantaneously turn into a positive. So as we say always, gasoline on the fire. And, you know, Mallard has been training with us for almost five years. He, he just hears these things day in and day out. Hey, that's gasoline on the fire. And that's where they just know the saying and stay with the first mistake. Don't create a second mistake. You're already on a 10-digit scholarship. You're already on a 10-digit scholarship. Tennis kids, just call home. Just call home. Um, with too many times kids just don't have the perspective. I mean, when we're at like a Panera, for example, nice little coffee shop, nice place to study because they have great internet. And I always stop and tell the kids I'm with, the kids that are in the real world are on the other side of the counter. Because when you go in, it's I usually go into a Panera. I've got teenage players that are being wait, waited on by teenage employees. Work as a volunteer. Yes, you know, if you don't have to think, well, what am I going to be paid to do this? I think tennis teachers, this is my opinion, and I know as far as circumstances are concerned, not everyone can do this, but I think tennis teachers should work three years for free. You know, take the role of starving artist, wait on tables at night, bartend, whatever you, whatever you have to do, work at night so you can be mentored by the right person. So, yeah, work as a volunteer. Rocky one, are you a pretender or a contender? Rocky one, we hear that all the time. We like to play the Rocky music. Um, if you want to dance, you got to pay the band. People are so pretentious. I know on my side of the fence, tennis teachers. I think so many tennis teachers pretend that they've actually developed players. They've actually taken someone from being a beginner to being a very respectable tournament player to take a beginner and all of a sudden, you know, years, few years down the road, they, they won national championships. But Rocky won. Now uh, we should just have a podcast on Rocky. What else you got? Don't be a third base coach. Yeah. You've been following our podcast. You hear that quite often. The third base coach, there's many consultants. They're coaching people who've already coached. You know, it's interesting how many of the TV commentators, they don't say many negative things about the players. Maybe I'm just being cynical, critical, but a lot of TV commentators are campaigning for jobs to coach players that are already making millions of dollars. But in tennis, we need more first base coaches. How to, you know, teach a kid how to hang onto the racket. What's the ready position? What are the basic fundamentals? But, um, I think at country clubs, for example, could be just tennis clubs. But many times the director of tennis has the job because they have a playing background and the lessons they're giving. They're just hitting with the kids that have climbed up the ladder and they hit pretty well. And it's, it's just the flip flopped where the, be, the beginners, the beginning players, the tiny tots, early childhood development, many times they have the inexperienced tennis teachers. Next number. 25. Get in the trenches. For us, get in the trenches means to teach beginners. I think many times somebody who teaches beginners um, Javier Palenque said that it's like we're a second class citizen, but get in the trenches. I think they should have tournaments on, you know, teaching beginners. Somebody might get lucky. So, okay, there's 32 beginners here. There's 32 tennis teachers. I'm fantasizing right now. We're going to have a tennis tournament and, you know, Vic Braden, there's some kid who bites ice cream cone and they put it right in the middle of their forehead. But, you know, some kids are much more coordinated. Many times 
the student in tennis, they're good despite how they were taught. Tennis owes you nothing. Hey, Roy Emerson. I've heard Roy Emerson say that many times. What a great speaker, what a great person. Years ago, I had the chance to be around Roy Emerson and it was at the John Wayne Tennis Club. I'll tell the story, but just briefly, as I was watching Billie Jean King, I had the privilege to watch Roy Emerson teach. He was coaching the Stasi, BJ Armitage, and Billie Jean King. And Billie was a little moody and she started yelling, yelling at us. I was with Kim Wittenberg and early in the morning, we'd already practiced. And Roy told Billy, if you don't practice those two guys, the lesson's over. She came over and she apologized. Amazing. But even someone, you know, an icon like Billie Jean King, a legend in her own right, but, you know, she was mentored by someone like Roy Emerson. Yeah, the game owes you nothing. You may not get what you expect, but you will get what you deserve. Say that again. You may not get what you expect, you will get what you deserve. Yeah, people just need to hear that. But I, I think, too, when you have water breaks, when we have people sit down, we say, all right, get your pencil and paper out. And we don't want to have them sit down for too long a period of time. We can be guilty of that. So that's where we say, okay, up, run a few laps around the court. Just quickly go through a drill we call a six-ball drill. Then, okay, say they're playing points, they get right back into their match. But everybody over here, and just to write that down. Uh, Jim Lair mentioned that. Write in cursive. Say it a third time. You may not get what you expect, but you will get what you deserve. So why I would have him say it a third time, he knows that, but you know, I say, okay, okay, all right, look me in the eye, and I start the sentence, and they finish it. Next. You have to give to get. Yeah, you don't want to be a taker. You don't want to be a taker. You want to give, 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 and, you know, your, your effort, you just, you know, again, coming back, to these all intertwine is, like, that kid has got an amazing work ethic. You can tell someone's work ethic by how they pick up balls. Who picks up the most balls? I mean, there's so many kids over the years, talking decades now, is ball pick up and I got to go to the bathroom. And it's like, you don't have to go to the bathroom. You're, you're just a con artist. You just are going to go because you're uh, guilty of being lazy. You don't want to pick up balls. Yes, sir. Come into the world with nothing. You leave with nothing, but appreciate everything in between. Peter Burwash. You come in the world with nothing, you leave the world with nothing, appreciate everything in between. It says these mind vitamins, um, yeah, make you stronger. Go ahead. Don't be a taker, be a giver. Yeah, that was covered. If is the biggest word in the dictionary. Rob Krychek. Don't be an ifer. If I had done this, if I had done that, you just don't want to be an ifer. So I think that's, they just call a kid. And again, we don't... Um, make nicknames stick, but you're such an iffer. You're just being an iffer. Um, you really have to help kids. You know, you just know some have a lot more self-doubt than others. If you work hard, that inner philosophy, if you work hard, you do the right things, good things are going to happen. They're not going to happen tomorrow. They're not going to happen next month, but yeah, if. I should have done this. I should have, I should have done that. I should have not done this, and I should have done that. And in the end, I shit all over myself. Oh, you shouldn't swear. That wasn't swearing, though. No. Sounded like it. Tony Robbins. That's worth repeating. I should have done this. I should have done that. I should have done this. I should have done that. And in the end, I shit all over myself. Um, you know, people just get up, be proactive, and go. Just don't hesitate. Don't put the pro in procrastination. So, um, as I, I believe I mentioned in the beginning of this, that when you're a student, uh, just a school year, wrote down over a thousand of these one-liners. Um, I said to someone the other day, and I said, well, that might be a stick. That might be someone that I will repeat over and over again. And I yelled out to a player, you're winning points, but you're losing your future. I didn't say that a little nicer. You're winning points, but you're losing your tennis future. Diplomacy, yes, and as far as the world's concerned and the peace and such, yes, Diplomatic relations are very important, but sometimes in tennis, most of the time in tennis, it just slows the process down. I think you need to operate on the premise that if it's good for the kid and it's good for the game, you say it. You know, you, you, the kids, they got to have thick skin. I mean, they can't get their feelings in the way. Give us a number. 33.
If you're bored, you're boring. I love that one. I use that one often. We're on 33. I can tell you the next one you've written down is, yeah, kid says you're boring. I go, no, you're boring. Uh, the next has to be, to be bored is to insult one's own intelligence. What's the next one? Winning is not boring. Vic Braden. You never hear someone go, rats, won again. Vic Braden. We can quote Vic Braden. Um, be great to get together with some Bradenites. You know, like Andy Fitzell and just on and on. There's quite a few of us. I just have so much respect, respect for Braden. It would be very easy to come up for, with a thousand quotes for Uncle Vic. We called him Uncle Vic because he's such a great guy. Everybody, once they got to know him, felt like Vic was their uncle. Learn to hit the same boring shot. Same boring shot. Think about football players. I mean, okay, we're going to control the line of scrimmage. We're going to control the clock. We're going to go 10 yards and get a first down. There's not that many fancy plays in football. You know, the flea flicker. Okay, it's, nothing's really that much of a surprise. Basics wins. Yes, sir. I like mushroom jobs. It's where they keep you in the dark, throw SHIT on you, and you still produce. I like that you spell that out so Andy doesn't have to edit it. Gordy Howe, great hockey player. Some say the greatest of all time. But he was working for the Detroit Red Wings, and what he said about his job is, I have a mushroom job. They keep me. In, I have a mushroom job. They keep me in the dark, throw fertilizer in my way, and I still produce. I think that is very, very important. Many times in tennis, you have to ask the tennis teaching: Does the pro make the place, or does the place make the pro? Um, you don't need fancy. You don't. You don't need um, a fancy facility to produce players. Actually, the way it works out, it's just the opposite. The fancier generally the worst. Tennis players come for their, where there's the least amount of court availability and they just really have to be hungry, hungry to hit balls. And you can practice anywhere and everywhere. Um, another number. Product knowledge in tennis coaching is generally 2%. The rest is fluff. If there's a product, you have to produce the product. Um, an efficient serve. Brady used to use the word elegant when we would talk about Roger Federer. But when you say ready play, I mean, when you show up, Braden used to say that over and over again. If you're going to measure a tennis teaching program, you're going to evaluate a junior development program, look at their worst player. And it's really unfortunate at grassroots level now there's backroom deals where people are recruiting um, you know, junior tennis players. You know, it's no secret, and I really respect Paul Terry for what he put together. He's been placed in the Hall of Fame, but he put an environment together. One of the reasons that he went bankrupt numerous times, and all you got to do is read, read his books, you know, he just tells you like it is, is he gave away so many scholarships. So many scholarships. Read that one again. Product knowledge in tennis coaching is generally 2%. The rest is fluff. Yeah, so if you go to a sports store and there's some nice young person waiting on you and they're selling you know, their equipment for 20 different sports, they're generally doing that. The salesmanship, it's on personality. 2% product knowledge, 98% people skills. And it's important to have the people skills. It's important to care. And, I mean, obviously to communicate. But that's where I think we're really falling short in tennis is people don't have product knowledge. Next number. 38. If there is a product, you should be able to produce it. Stroke production. That's a great word. Stroke production. Junior development. And are people really developing their strokes? I mean, where is this going to go? I mean, I mean, so many kids, the way they're hanging out of the racket. Years ago at a conference in New York City, I wasn't there, but I got a manuscript of the conference. It was the bees. It was Boletary, it was Braden, it was Burwash. Vandermeer was part of it, and so was Robert Lansdorp. And they all spoke about American tennis. And Robert, it sounded like he was swearing, but he wasn't. He was there for crying out, geez. But he would say that, you know, the USDA, our governing body of tennis, they're inviting these kids in, they're 15 years old, they're spending so much money on them. And what he said is they're hanging out of the racket like it's a frying pan. 
Um, but I think that in that setting, and obviously we have so much respect for all the coaches I just mentioned, but Vic was going over brain typing. And really, I think Robert was the one who was right on his grips. You know, how do you hang on to the racket? All the ramifications from the grip. Get a grip of a lifetime. You know, we'll yell that out on the tennis courts. I told that to a young player today. I mean, they're starting to have their backhand grip go too far over. And you just need to know, well, they, when they make that, that flaw, there's going to be a counter flaw. Give us another number. 39. Don't tell me what you think. Tell me what you know. Yeah, when we have someone come in for an assessment, we make a video. I, I just tell the parents and the player, yeah, mallard has got to stop and start. Malhar's back. What was that last one? Don't tell me what you think. Tell me what you know. Yeah, everybody's got an opinion. I'm sure that's in there, too. When hey. you're thinking, you're stinking. With, let's go back to the last one. Uh, Don't tell me what you think. Tell me what you know. Yeah, knowledge is power. Then the application of knowledge. With, um, go ahead, skip ahead. What do you got? Opinions are like noses. Everyone has one. Yes, usually they use a different part of the body when that is stated. Um, fair enough. If, uh, like I said, Malar, he's been around a long time. I'd be interested in his opinion. If someone's here and they're just starting with us, uh, we had a coach who spent five years with us, Chad Berryhill. You know, he's has two teams that are usually in the top ten at St. Leo University. He won a national title as a junior coach. And he spent again five years with us. He told people he has to be, he'd be with us two years to have a, to really know what's going on. So you you know, you're not gonna show up and you know, hang out for a couple of days. So but if somebody's been around for a long time, it's okay, tell me what you think. But for the most part, is there's so much learning in the beginning. We're not so interested in people's opinions. Go ahead. The more you say, the less you know. That's, I think that's true with some TV commentators. I unfortunately pick on TV commentators a little too much. You have to keep in mind that a TV commentator, they're only talking in sound bites. If you really want to find out what they know about forehands and backhands, do a little YouTube homework and find a clinic setting where they're talking about the serve. And they're talking about the serve for like 30 minutes. Um, you know, I'd say, everybody goes, I found these are the secrets. There are no secrets. There's no secret sauce. Give us another one. Let your racket do the talking. Rod Laver. Rod Laver. Let your racket do the talking. We tell people, you know, it's, you want to be confident, but you don't want to be cocky. It's so important. With, you know, you don't need to tell someone your level of play. You know, don't be braggadocious. They'll, they'll know in no time. And if you're, if you're really accomplished, you're really good at something, somebody else will be able to share that message. You don't have to toot your own horn. Talk is cheap. Actions speak louder than words. You just let people go like this. So seeing the movie Moneyball, Brad, Brad Pitt. Talk, talk, talk. Uh, Vic Braden, if you talk a lot, you get thin lips. Um, just get up and go. Get up early in the morning. You own the city. There's no traffic. Get up and go. Courts are always empty. You know, if you show up at tennis courts, obviously this is outdoor courts. If you get there at sunrise, you're going to get a court. You're going to get a court. Next number. 45. Your cell phone is a dream color. That's shouted out at our courts all the time. My mother used to tell me, don't use the word hate. Well, I hate cell phones. I was going to be the last person in the world to get a cell phone. Um, I was married for many, many years, and two children, and my former wife and two kids had cell phones. I didn't have a cell phone. I finally had to get a cell phone, and then I didn't text for the longest time. And then people say, well, do you text? And I say, I only read my text messages after midnight. But I pride myself on having very poor telephone skills. I understand it. In some ways, that's a negative, but I really do. I don't strongly dislike, I hate the phone. It's zapping the life out of kids. Parents should have rules. I mean, they should really just have a flip phone, kids. Um, with Kids should get home, put their phone on the kitchen counter. All right, go ahead. What do you got? Unplug your phone and plug in your personality. My brother Pat used to always say that to people. 
or his personality was a little bit over the top, but plug in your personality, shake hands, stand up. I mean, we have tennis juniors that don't greet, especially they don't greet parents. They can't, they struggle. They can say good morning. You know, we did have a podcast on brain typing, but for me, throw that out the window, introverted, extroverted. Yeah, we know it's a little more difficult for, for the introverts, but hey, if you can't say good morning to someone here, you can't hit balls. How's it go? It takes um, 14 muscles to smile and 72 to frown. You know, lighten up from last week, Don Myers. You know, take the game seriously, but don't take yourself too seriously. You know, these these type of statements, quotes, mind vitamins, they just become part of the coach's DNA, and then you want to have it be where you're, you're wiring your players to really respond the same way. You know, what I tell kids very often is that I've developed a lot of years to um, I, I've dedicated a lot of years, hopefully, to develop a tennis mind. And what I'm trying to do is share things that are mindful to me. That's very interesting in uh, Great Britain. In England, on a, here in the U.S., on a set of steps, it'll say, watch your step. In England, it says, mind your step. Much better. Much better say, mind your step versus watch your step. Be a switched on kid. Yeah, one of our parents says that all the time, and I just love it. Uh, he also says, uh, how's this movie going to play out? Another is, uh, you're the author of your own story. Or say that one again. Be a switched on kid. Switched on. You're plugged in. You're proactive. Stephen Covey, by the late Stephen Covey, one of uh, the habits of highly seven, seven habits of highly successful people. Be proactive. Plug it in. Be switched on. Go. Um, Obviously, no one has their alarm go off in the morning and they just jump out of bed um, and go, yes, it's a new day. But get, get up, do some push-ups, do some sit-ups, um, get your motor started. Uh, okay, with adults, we back off on adults and we let them drink coffee. But we tell kids, hey, you don't need to have the coach jumpstart your heart. Go ahead. Remember the athlete's a biocomputer. Yeah, garbage in, garbage out. You're a biocomputer. You're programming your brain. I think two powerful words. We say it all the time on these videos we make. Brain memory. We used to use the term muscle memory. Muscles don't store memory. So be switched on. You grow myelin at a faster rate. Myelin, the substance the brain produces from all motor programming for speed and smoothness of movement. Give us a number. 51. 51. Halfway. Let's go. What do you got? Cut the self-promotion. Yeah, I mean, in tennis teaching, maybe not so much for players, but if they're spending lots of time looking up their UTR, talking about their UTR, but I think that's really amazing in tennis. Um, and what we understand that it's, it's someone's uh, gravy train, it's uh, their livelihood to fill their lesson book. But um, we need to have a podcast where, without mentioning names, being politically correct, is just to read the first sentence of someone's bio. It's absolutely amazing. It's so, for, it's so easy for people to say, there's nothing like this in the world. It's nothing like this out there. 52, deck of cards, what do you got? Get a shovel. Yes, that's the hockey line. And I think hockey people, tennis people, I've spent a lot of time in both sports. Um, get a shovel means you're around a BS artist. How deep is it? Get a shovel. So you, a lot of times tennis kids won't know what that means. Get a shovel. Hockey kids will know what that means. You're just somebody who's, yeah, 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 they're BS, they're BSing you. What do you got? Merchant of flesh scenario. Yeah, that's been covered in our podcast. Um, so some of these are uh, not necessarily for goal-oriented juniors, um, but merchant of flesh, I mean, Parents, run the other way. When you're at a junior tournament and a coach starts talking to you about your son or daughter, they're a third base coach, they're a merchant of flesh. And I understand college tennis, that's recruiting. I've talked about pro sports. Um, my brother, who was a scout and a coach and a general manager, assistant general manager, general manager in the NHL, okay, fair enough, you're, you're a recruiter. But... Uh, we need more developers 
And that, that's our goal with the Great Base, is to help people become a better developer, develop teachers, develop players. 53, 54, where are we? 54. Generally, it's not burnout, it's frustration factor. Yeah, I mean, you have to catch on fire to burn out. You have to catch the on fire to burn out. People get frustrated. People just be practicing three, four hours. They get to the point where there's a ceiling on their game, how good they can get. I mean, their elbows in, their racket faces open, they're volleying like this, so then they don't volley. And then they're frustrated. Then they start yelling and screaming. Um, but burnout, um, I think it's misunderstood. It's generally frustration factor. Go ahead. You have to catch on fire before you burn out. Yeah, you got that. If you coast, you toast. If you coast, you toast. Um, yeah, go ahead. If you cruise, you lose. Yeah, you can only go downhill if you cruise. Go ahead. To be extraordinary, you need to do the ordinary, extraordinary amount of times. That's kind of a tongue twister. Have someone say that. To be extraordinary, you have to do the ordinary and extraordinary amount of time. Again, there's no fluff. There's no, as I said, secret sauce. You know, I, 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 I've got this, I've got that. No, no. It's fundamentals. It's fundamentals. You know, I mean, I just think it's just amazing how everybody's coming up with their own two cents. This is how you hit the forehand. The forehand of today is, it's really, I mean, how much nonsense is out there? Go ahead. I do gifted and talented math. I've heard several kids say that. I, I'm trying to explain the court, down the line, cross court, 19.1 degrees, come to the net. You know, a lot of kids, they're young and they haven't taken that type of math. Say we sit down with your parents and you can draw a circle, and you draw a line, the net would be the diameter that goes east and west, that's 180 degrees, you go three feet back. But kids get too much praise. I do talented and gifted math. And it's going, really? Um, and you've got to get to the point where, where junior players can look back at that and go, yeah, I said that. That was so dumb. Um, Jefferson, integrity and humor. You've got to be able to laugh at yourself. What do you got? We're in the 60s. 61. Book smarts and street smarts. Yeah, Andy Fitzell, I've heard him say so many times. Uh, is it dumb smart kid or smart dumb kid? Dumb smart kid. A dumb smart kid. Uh, I mentioned Spencer Johnson's name from Salt Lake. As I say that, um, need water, a little Mormon champagne? No, With, uh, read it again. Book smarts versus street smarts. Yeah, you're helping my train of thought. Senior moment. Spencer Johnson, he's from Utah. I go, ah, there's no streets in Utah. You don't necessarily have to be on the streets, but if mom and dad are taking care of everything, Everything. Parents need to think outside the box, use a little imagination. So, okay, how, how can we teach some perspective here? Go ahead. IQ versus EQ. Why don't you tell us that? IQ versus EQ. IQ is your intelligence quotient. EQ is your emotional quotient. Yeah, Mallard's smarter than I am. IQ. But EQ, uh, with all kids, emotional intelligence. There's a book, emo um, Your Emotional Intelligence, and there's an Emotional Intelligence 2.0. But kids can hear those two words, just like brain memory, emotional intelligence. Uh, you know, I picked this up from Torben Ulrich. I heard him interviewed live, Boca West in the 70s, at one of Bill Reardon's tournaments. And they asked him how old he was. The Great Dane, he had legs like an 18-year-old when he was 48, and had the long ponytail. And he said, well, how do you mean? Chronologically, intellectually, physically, spiritually. So when I'm asked that, someone says, well, how old is that player? And I just say, well, what do you mean, chronologically? I mean, we all know some 40-year-olds that are 15. Um, you want to be mature beyond your years. It's like with Boris Becker, when Wimbledon in 85, he said, I have three daddies, and I listened to them all. It was his own father, Jan Tyriak, who bought his uh, rights from the German Tennis Federation, and Guter Bosch, two Romanians. And what I mean by that, by the rights, that happens right here in the U.S. where you have to sign a form. And if the USDA is spending quite a bit of money on a kid when they're a junior, the kid is really pledging to, um, it doesn't hold up because the kid's under the age of 18. But 
uh, the kid is pledging to uh, play Fed Cup, now Billie Jean King Cup or, or Davis Cup. Number, sir? 63. Often, a large tennis club in a small city in the U.S. does not produce one college player per year. Yes. That sounds pessimistic, doom and gloom, but um, all you have to do is go through tennisrecruiting.net, find out where the blue chips are. Used to be uh, 20 per class, now it's 25 that are blue chips, and there's five-star, four-star, three-star. You find out where the players are. Uh, but no, it's... It's, it's true. Many times a large tennis club in a small city don't produce one college tennis player per year. And then there's no accountability for that. It's like, well, all these kids were taking lessons. What happened? And then there's just another wave of kids coming in and it's like, wait a minute, what happened to that group? What happened to the kids who were born in such and such year? The kids who started the program when they were five, six years old. Granted, you know, parents can move. Uh, kids can choose another sport, but um, yeah, kids kind of fade away because they haven't really been taught well. It's too easy to say I want to play D1 college tennis. I hear that all the time, D1. Kids that really are not that exposed to tennis, they say I want to play D1. I know a French coach we used to work with and send his players to us. And he would call it the first division, the second division, the third division. Now, there's some players in Division Three that could play Division One. There's teams in Division Three that could beat player teams in Division One, but um, I think just to play college tennis, you know, not that you have to play Division One. Yes, I want to play for the, the best possible team, but you want to just be able to play. Um, you know, that's where I think um, too many times, you know, players don't know how great it is to be part of a team. So I know a lot of kids that we've worked with that could have played D3 tennis. They choose they chose not to continue their tennis and you know live and let live, but I think they would have been much better off to choose to be part of a team. It's like going to college and it's like having a job at the same time. It's 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 a great opportunity. 85% of the players that don't make their college team as a freshman don't make it the rest of their college career. So, from our players' notes, that sounds like a shocker. We're not trying to scare anyone. But it's like, whoa, I'm going to work. You can be great. You're going to have to put in a great effort. Have a great attitude. But yes, it's, 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 it's right around 85% that players don't play as a freshman. They don't play. They don't make the lineup. They don't make the lineup. But what happens, a lot of the girls will fade away and, and, uh, and stop playing, which is unfortunate. A lot of boys, the Macho Meligo again, you know, they're number two in their dorm. They're number two in their dorm room. There's only two beds, and they're number two in the room. And the next year, they think they're going to be number one in the world. But um, the guys have a tendency versus the gals not. The guys hang in there. But... A lot of times what they'll do is they'll start to complain about playing time. Say, for example, there's 12 guys on a college tennis team, eight travel, and there's three coaches, head coach, assistant coach, volunteer. For years and years, I, I would have thought that, as I still, I think if I was a coaching a tennis team, I would leave uh, one coach at home. I'd leave one coach at home. I would do what Jim Verdict did. I would coach from the bottom up, and I would make sure hey, that number 12 player is going to move up and, and challenge people and, and make the team stronger from the bottom. But a lot of times what the guys do, the team travels, they, they just sit around and complain. Winners train, losers complain. There's all sorts of things that we shout off that we've stolen from T-shirts. What number you got? 66. Yeah. You are really only a pro player if you make money. Yeah, when it comes down to, oh, I played the tour. Well, now with the, with the internet, you just Google someone and you find out, found out that they, they only made $2,000. Now, if someone made, you know, in the range of $100,000, they're a really good tennis player. It's difficult to make money in pro tennis and it's approved a little bit. Um, it's, just, it's just not done right where the, the players that are playing at the low level tournaments. But, um, I do think there's a lot of people that say they play pro tennis and they didn't play pro tennis. I mean, just to get one ATP WTA point is not easy. You can research that. You know, most most players are 
you know, close to 20 years old. I mean, I mean, super, some superstars didn't get their first ATP point until they were 19. 67, what word defines you? That's a great exercise. And then, you know, put that word where you study, where you do your homework. I like the word tenacity, tenacious. Absolutely, you have absolute, you're absolutely, you're certain, there's a definition, you look it up. Um, you're absolutely certain that what you want to transpire will transpire. I knew it was in there. I'm losing it though, Mallory, I'm losing it. Give me another one. It's not loving to win and hating to lose. It's just doing anything and everything to become a better competitor. Notre Dame campus. I went to the NCAs to watch Julie Scott play. Um, I did a clinic on the road as well. And Joanna Russell, who was a great tennis player, she was working for Andy Brandy as an assistant coach at the University of Florida. And that particular year, Florida won. Sujay Lama was one of the coaches. And Joanna Russell hit with my kids. They were really young. And it was some fun. She said, oh, you guys hit some ground strokes, but I bet you can't volley. And they came up and they could volley a little bit. But she did tell them that. It's not loving to win, hating to lose. It's just doing anything and everything to be a better competitor. That's where, you, you know, you push away the chocolate chip cookies. You really have to be disciplined. That's what a competitor is. It's hard to have rich parents and poor kids. John McEnroe, affluenza. Um, with uh, parents have to do their very best. Affluent parents, affluenza, trying to have their kid be hungry. Give them chores. Make them earn the right to play tournaments. You know, don't just uh, let them become high maintenance. Don't let them just be a taker. Don't let them just take things for granted. Give me another number. Seventy. Take responsibility. Pick Braden. You know, think have a have a favorite word. You have a least favorite word. My least favorite word would be lazy. Oh, go back to that lazy. You don't want to be called lazy. But Braden, that was his number one thing. Take responsibility. Um, just in every aspect of life, just take responsibility. I mean, your parents, uh, the junior players, your parents have a job. Are they going to be promoted, demoted? It's the same thing. It's real world. They have their job. They have to go do their job. Tennis player, you signed up. You put down on a piece of paper that you want to be really good. Okay. I like the word project versus job, but it's like, okay, let's get after this. Be your brother's keeper. Dennis Vandermeer. Dennis Vandermeer. I reprimanded a player today. He played a tournament. His younger brother went, and this is, happens all the time. I've known this player, like Mallard, five years. And I asked the younger brother, what did you do? You're at the tournament. Did you do a driveway workout? Did you find a backboard? Did you uh, go for a run? I mean, you don't just sit around and watch your brother. I mean, okay, I cheer for your brother, but you don't need to have a basket of balls and a coach feeding you balls. I mean, you got to be a self-starter. you you got to be switched on. Again, switched on. Um, but no, no, it's just kids just comfortable. You know, you do one push-up, you start to grow muscle. You know, you tell someone that. Go ahead. Get a job, go to work. That's a sign for uh, Bill Belichick has been so successful with uh, New England Patriots. I heard Nick Saban say this in a speech. Belichick only has one sign up and it just says, do your job. Now, uh, the Patriots over the years, some journalists said, I don't like to interview the Patriots. They all say the same thing. Got to make plays. Got to do our job. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's your job as a tennis kid, get up and don't have your mom be packing your snacks. I mean, come on, go to work. What do you got? Everybody has 24 hours in a day. Yeah, whether you're rich or poor, young or old, 24 hours. What do you do with the 24 hours? Today is the first day of the rest of your life. Something like that, everybody heard from their parents or from their their parents and on and on. Yeah, today's the first day of the rest of your life. You can't waste a day. Can't waste a day. Granted, people need to take a break. A change is as good as a rest. From Don Meyer last week, just to have a meeting in different rooms. Um, this is a change for us, our podcast room. We're, we're relocating, so go ahead.
We have met the enemy, and the enemy is us. Yeah, so we can ask the, all these different things. God, just ask you, who's the enemy? You know, who's where's the competition? The competition is the person in the mirror. The enemy. Um, we've met the enemy, and the enemy is us. People create their own interference. There's a great book. Um, champions don't. How's it go? You tell me. Champions don't get in their own way. That's right. There you go. You pulled me out on that one. Brain cramp. Senior moment. Go ahead. There's a close connection between getting up in the morning and getting up in the world. You heard that already. Already. So again, these all intertwine. Close connection between getting up in the morning. It doesn't hurt to get up early. From last week, uh, Don Meyer, well, if a farmer can milk cows at 5.30 in the morning, we can have basketball practice at 5.30 in the morning. Um, we condition kids for college tennis because when they get to college, the honeymoon's over once they sign, and it's a dictatorship. The coach is in charge. And mom and dad, you have to understand that really successful college tennis programs, once your kid is 18 years old, they're on campus, they don't want to hear from the parent. They want to deal with they want to deal with the eighteen year old. The early bird catches the worm. Another oldie goldie. The early bird catches the worm. Go ahead. Nothing good happens after midnight. Oldie goldie again. With you know, for kids just to be able to have that discipline, go to bed to get up early. And you know, really smart college coaches, they're not gonna have, I don't know, say a weekend where they're not playing matches, say in the fall. There's no matches. And they say, oh, we'll, we'll practice Saturday, telling the, the boys, especially, of men's college tennis team, we're going to practice Saturday at 2. Well, that means the guys are going out partying Friday night. They well, no, no problem. And college coaches, we'll practice at 5 a.m. And then they're not going to go out and stay out so late. Um, most college coaches, they figure out, they figure they have to give one day off a week. They're not going to give a Saturday off. They're going to say, well, you can go out Sunday. And then, you know, everybody's party on the college campus on Friday and Saturday. You know, Sunday is not the day to give a college tennis player a day off um, if they want to, you know, get all pumped up about a keg of beer. Go ahead. The late Stephen Covey, write your own eulogy. Yeah, it's a pretty heavy exercise for kids to write their own eulogy. I like to have kids write their own bio. And you've heard that in our podcast. Um, and with education, there's a lot of repetition. But to have a kid write a bio, and um, we pride ourselves on peer teaching. The highest form of retention for learning is to teach. You know, Mallard does a great, great job going out and teaching stroke production. Say that again, Stephen Covey. Write your own eulogy. Yeah, so that's where, you know, for younger kids listening, I know some kids listen to these talks when they're in their parents' car. That means at a funeral, someone's passed away, and then what is someone going to say? What are they going to read, uh, perhaps, or what, um, about the person who just passed away? I know my mother passed away. I had a friend of mine, Mark Costello, read what I wrote, because certainly at my mother's funeral, I didn't think I could uh, speak. Actually, I can get kids to, uh, I don't try to do this, but I get kids to cry. You, know, you just give them a little tough love. And they start to, the tears come down. But I also pride myself in, in, in getting kids to stop crying very quickly. When you cry, you breathe in. So you get kids to say, just go, you're starting to cry. That's all right. It really hurts. That's okay. You're learning from this. You're going to grow. But in through your nose, out through your mouth. So a kid starts to cry and you just have to do these breathing exercises. <sighs> You gotta, you gotta be able to get kids to just stop crying, you know. Go ahead. Think in analogies. Yeah, we were talking about this the other day, where, and you could tell by looking in um, players' eyes. I said, imagine it's Pee Wee football, Pop Warner football. I played Pop Warner football. My first year, I didn't get a uniform. I had a brother who never got a uniform because he weighed too much, so I didn't weigh enough. But can you imagine Pop Warner football if they said, well, we're not going to throw the ball. Because when you throw the ball, three things can happen. And two of them are bad. It could be an incompletion or interception. So in football, they put the ball in the air. In tennis, the ball's in the air. And it's never is a strong word. Almost never do young players hit the ball in the air, except for the surf. They're not playing in overheads. 
they're not they're not playing a conventional approach shot, approach volley. Yeah, probably sometimes by chance they will play a swinging volley. Go ahead, analogies. Time out, round three. What number we on? 82. Number 82. He will get out what you put in. Yes, they, kids need to hear that. You'll get out what you put in. Because, you know, they, kids should have pencil and paper. Write it down. You're going to get out what you put in. If you put in the extra hours, people don't, kids, people don't really know what a day off is. Like Roger Federer, if I stop practicing at 3 o'clock on Saturday and I get to 3 o'clock on Sunday, I've had 24 hours off. But kids usually always stop practicing Saturday at 3 and then it's, you know, Sunday at 3, then maybe they're a regular schooler, and then they get out at 3. That's 48 hours off. It's not a day off. Time management. Go ahead. If you chop wood all day, you'll have a pile of wood at the end of the day. That's good to hear one of my father's quotes. I heard that once as a kid. I heard it a thousand times. Yeah, if you chop wood all day, you'll have a, chop of wood. You'll have a pile of wood. If you chop wood all day, you'll have a pile of wood. Go ahead. I've spent my entire life saying all the right things to all the wrong people. I think I have that right. Uh, I never met Dave Anderson's father, but I heard Anderson share. My father used to say, my father used to say. And unfortunately, in some cases, I think that way in tennis. You know, I've spent a lot of time saying the right things to the wrong people. Go ahead. Unfortunately, when you give motivational speeches, you generally only motivate the motivated. Yeah, you have to be careful with motivational speeches. I always talk about pro ice hockey, and um, years ago they used to have these one-way contracts. So someone is playing seriously. They're playing in the NHL. They're making ninety thousand dollars. They go down to the American Hockey League. They make nine thousand dollars. They just move the decimal point one over. With um, read that again. Unfortunately, when you give motivational speeches, usually you only motivate the motivated. So to have Mallory read that again, it's like, okay, let me stop and think about that. Things really need to be repeated at least three times. And then if they, play, if they write it down. Um, but, yeah, there's a, there's a danger zone to that where you, don't, you some people need to take a chill pill. Some people need to relax. Some people are working too hard. They're not sleeping enough. So you can definitely over-motivate. Uh, in pro sports, it's said that there's not too many pep talks. Because if you make it to the major league, you don't want to go to the minor leagues. Um, in hockey, they call the second team, for years we call the second team, a farm team. They're down at the farm. They, um, they, they, want to, they want to have the kid, the younger player coming up, so they have to produce. They go down to the farm. You know, they're not, um, I think of the New York Rangers. You know, do you want to be in New York City playing with the big team or you want to be in New Haven, Connecticut? You want to be, you know, traveling first class or riding on a bus. So a lot of times you, you don't even have to give motivational speeches. Motivation means to move. Yeah, I mean, I just would, if I ask a kid, what's motivation mean? It means to move. So it takes so kids so long to transition from a water break to the courts. And, and it's amazing habits that, you know, it's the same kid is going to be last every time. It's just amazing. And you got to let them know. You're the last kid out there. You're going to pick up the least amount of balls. Um, you know, with that, sometimes you just got to crack the whip and say, here are the consequences. And you say, no, if you're not the first person out there, you got to go do this. Got to give them something they don't want to do. Go ahead. Don't let money be on your God. You don't let money be your God. I mean, that's where, same thing with, um, same thing with tennis teaching is that, you know, if it's just, Money, um, I just, how much money are you making? How much money are you making? You know, are you making any players? Are you making any players? What number are we on? 88. 88. Hang in there, group. If anybody's listening out there. Never try to be better than your opponent. Yeah, we got to get some John Wooden quotes out there. A lot of people don't understand that. Never try to be better than your opponent. You, you can only control the controllables. You can only control yourself. And, you know, we find that all the time. That, one kid hits the ball hard, the kid on the other side, they do the same thing. They try to hit the ball back harder. Yeah, you don't need to be trying to be better than your opponent. Again, the competition's in the mirror. 
Fundamentals stand the test of time. Give us a countdown. What number we on? 89. 89. I thought we were in the last 10. John Wooden. Fundamentals stand the test of time. Go ahead next. Don't mistake activity for learning. We come back to fundamentals. The fundamental doesn't change. The speed at which you have to execute the fundamental changes. And another Woodenism you mentioned, this happens all the time. I've traveled to many tennis programs to help with the tennis teachers, and this is how the program ends. The parents are there. I see it all the time in indoor courts especially. And there's three empty courts, and everybody's on one court. And sometimes it's called Tennis Olympics, Crush and Rush. And there's two players on one side, feeding the ball, play the point off the approach. After you win that, you tag up to the baseline, feed the ball in, the coach feeds the ball in. Play a volley, you win that, tag up to the baseline, then you feed up a lob. And then you run to the other side, and everybody's so excited. Now, um, that drill can be great if you have great technique. But for the most part, it's just activity. I know some college tennis teams use that as a drill. Give us a number now. We'll go down. 91. 91. What do we got? It's not the will to win. It's the will to prepare. Bobby Knight. Everybody's heard that. But kids need to hear it. You know, So a young kid, they're, they're, they're just 11 years old. They need to hear that. And they need to say it, and they need to finish your sentence. It's not the will to win, it's what? And then they have to say it. Very important to do this exercise. They have to be able to say it. It's got to be on the tip of their tongue. What do you got? You have to get in position to get in position. Bobby Knight again. You know, with people do that with their jobs. Okay, I've got to do this, this level job first to be able to do this level job second. Same thing with tennis. Same things with tennis. You know, actually the way it works is the better your ground strokes are, you're going to get the opportunity to hit approach shots. But what happens is so people start to develop some very good ground strokes and they have an approach shot, they don't know what to do. So they just blast a ground stroke. And they don't even get to the third stage of the court. And with some people would say there's a fourth stage. There's a red zone, offensive area, the red zone inside the court. The transition, the, the yellow part of the court, like a traffic light, and then green being, being up at the net. Go ahead. We form our habits and our habits, habits form us. What number is that? 93. 93. The top 10. The David Letterman. Top 10. Kids would have to look that up. They wouldn't know who David Letterman is now. If he's been retired for five years, kids, kids, the kids you're coaching won't even know who Letterman is. Mickey Mantle. Uh, we form our habits and our habits form us. That's another one that you can go to is that, you know, we form our habits and then our habits form us. If, you know, if a kid is lazy when they're 12, it's a very safe bet they're going to be lazy when they're 13. Um, and, you know, we just had a young guy here. He proved quite a bit, but um, just doesn't like to run. Rule number one is do just the opposite of what you want to do. And now kids have a very difficult time pulling themselves not only away from each other. Um, you, how's it go? You can't soar like an eagle if you're hanging out with turkeys. Has that made the list? Yeah. What number is that? 99. 99. We'll say that again when we get there. Give us another one. Storytelling for Mental Toughness. Jim Lair, one of his books. Um, and I think with uh, Don Meyer last week, talk about previous players. You get to be my age. I hope I get to 70 here in a couple of years. Is There's so many stories. There's so many stories. Go ahead. If you don't know the history of your subject, you don't know the subject. Yeah, with um, people really need to study tennis. You know, if, and I, I think that's a big push with the Great Base is that we study tennis, and we've studied tennis teachers that have gone before us, and that's not part of the industry norm, not at all. I mean, for me, I have a hard time just fathoming how could someone who's teaching tennis not have heard of Vic Braden. I, I just I just can't fathom that. Go ahead. You have to deal with the past to deal with the present to work for the future. Yeah, it's not like kicking a dead horse. Kids made mistakes. You gotta bring it back up. You gotta bring it back up. Yeah, you wanna forget John Wooden, you know, that's one of the four stages where he says a mistake, forget it. But at the same time, you know, you do have to okay, let's go through this. You've been in this situation before, you gotta learn from it. It's actually very good and you think about following team sports, whether it's uh, saying football, team winning the national championship or a team winning the Super Bowl. 
it's actually very good when they, they lose at the end. You know, they had a really good season and they made the playoffs. They don't lose in the, they don't lose in the playoffs. A really good season, make the playoffs. But right towards the end of the season, they had, they have a hiccup. It's actually good for them. But you have to go through, through why, through why. Don't get stuck on it. Don't berate and beat them up over it, but go, Hey, let's, let's review the history here. Yesterday's history, tomorrow's a mystery, and today is the present. That's why it's called a gift. Say it again. Yesterday's history, tomorrow's a mystery, today is the present. That's why it's called a gift. And Malhar would not need to have, look that up. Is that, you know, today's a gift. But to have a kid, say, okay, tell me that. It's amazing how much useless information one can store in the brain. But the, these things that are mind vitamins, as from the, if you're in the world of sport, you, you don't think that uh, it's useless. It's it's more like priceless. What number? Ninety-eight. Ninety-eight. You never get a second chance for a first impression. That's true. You never get a second chance for a first impression. But at the same time, you really shouldn't have to make a first impression. You shouldn't have to try to impress someone. Uh, I tell the story often that Vic Braden used to tell is that he was teaching at the Jack Kramer tennis club. Jack Kramer shows up to watch the juniors. Every kid's using a Jack Kramer racket and they were trying to impress Jack Kramer. He stayed five minutes. He said, I'm going to leave. I can't watch this anymore. But when I come back, I hope you can keep the ball in play. Say that one again, 99. You never get a second chance for a first impression. If you're not trying to make an impression. You're not trying to make an impression. Then you become an authentic person. If you're just yourself, 24/7. Go ahead. You can't soar like an eagle if you're. You can't soar like an eagle if you're hanging around with turkeys. Yes, it's good to repeat that. With, um, yeah, with. I heard one brother who told his younger brother. You need to get some new friends. You know, who are you hanging out with? Um, and I tell people that all the time, that it's good to have buddies. It's good to have fun. But who are you going to call crunch time? Who are you going to call? People are going to turn to their parents, which is a great thing if they can do that. I'd say um, a majority of young children are, are blessed that way. They can turn to their parents. Is that it? Is there a one-on-one? Last one. Oh, man, what's this? Consumer beware. Oh, wow. Consumer beware. Um, Dave Fish, who was interviewed on our podcast, uh, one time he told me that that should be the name of our program, Consumer Beware. Tennis parents are blindly writing checks. It's a blind leading the blind. The tennis teaching profession, again, sounds doom and gloom, but it's totally unregulated. There's some stronger words, fraudulent criminal. For me, how can you look into a kid's eyes and you know you're winging it? You know you're just making it up. And you've been coaching the kid and you're charging X amount of dollars per hour. You know, the kid's got a palm up serve and you don't even know that. You don't even know what palm up is. And, you know, check your ego at the door. And, and, you know, I think a lot of times, again, uh, that term play God is that, well, the kid's not very hard worker. Oh, the kid's not very talented. But consumer beware. That's, I'd say something about the great base is, um, teaching is information transfer and, um, for me, I'm always puzzled, like, why can't you tell that the, the, the kids aren't really learning efficient tennis? Now, I'm not a swimmer. I went to a prep school where you had to swim a mile to graduate. And I had a mother who was emphatic about you had to pass the life-saving to a certain level. I'm not a swimmer, but I tell people that um, if you look at a kid who can't swim, I mean, it's a life-saving skill, but... You look at a kid who can't swim, you just know instantly they can't, they can't swim. People who have never, ever been into a hockey rink and they see someone on a pair of skates, they just know the person can't skate. But for some reason in tennis, and I think it comes back to the line we share all the time, when crummy plays crummier, who wins? Crummy wins, but crummy doesn't know they're crummy. In tennis, t- tennis teaching circles, two plus two equals whatever you, whatever you want it to be. Tennis is in a crisis. You know, the lane that we're in teaching and coaching, it's in a crisis. Um, all you have to do is watch people play doubles. 
We always tease. Uh, Mallory, you need two things to be a servant volley. What are they? Servant volley. You need a servant volley. And if you don't serve and volley, what do you not do? Servant volley. You don't serve and volley. It's like learn by making mistakes. Braden, the tennis court's a mistake center. I mean, hit a serve. And you always say, well, I get the ball in this way. And it's like, well, we tell parents, you know, they think, oh, this is going well. And we say, no, the, the, the light at the end of the tunnel is a train coming right at your kid. I was one time in Germany and it was a Mark Hamill, a longtime friend. So there was a gentleman, he wanted me to see his son serve. So he's, his kid's not even four years old. Comes out and the kid tosses the ball up like this and he gets the ball in the box just like this. And the dad's a proud papa. He says, what do you think? I said, don't ever let him do that again. And he was just confused. He was just confused. But consumer beware. Um, don't judge the unfinished product. If someone's teaching tennis and they're doing it well, it is slow. It is um, mechanical. It does look robot-like. It does look stiff. If um, it's just instant fun and people are moving around and um, you know they're playing instant tennis, mini tennis, yeah, that's fun. And you need to work on that. We do that right away as we play all sorts of versions of mini tennis. But we also teach fundamentals. And you know, kids can play mini tennis and think they're doing great. Uh, that's one thing about the... The red ball, orange, green dot. There's no science behind it. Well, because the ball doesn't bounce as high, kids are not supposed to use a Western grip. Well, go watch and see how they're playing. There's kids are still playing like this. Um, they're great. Wayne Bryan, the, the, the transition balls are great training tools. They're great training tools. But always take a second look. Always take a second look. And... Um, you can't microwave tennis teaching. You know, you can't microwave player player development. Let's do this. We'll put the pressure on Mallard. Why don't you just give us one maybe that we haven't mentioned? Could you think of one? We said we've had a thousand. The wheels are turning. I'm not being negative. I'm just being honest. Yeah, this, this, I'm not being negative. I'm just being honest. Um, they're, they're in high-level coaching. There is no negative. There is no positive. But Malar, thanks for doing this. Hope everybody got something out of this. We will get back on track with um, two three-way conversations, interviews. But thanks for listening.